Okay, we're back. We're back. We're live. We're here on Wednesday. We love Wednesday because Wednesday has not only Hawaii the state of energy at 4 to 5, but at 3 to 4 we have catching up with Kaka'ako, which has turned out to be a really great, no, I get so excited, turned out to be a really great examination of what's going on in the city. You know, it feels like we're in, in touch with something. It's the, it's the cloth mother out there. Kaka'ako is all of our cloth mother. And to make this examination, to have the opportunity to talk about it while it's happening is so exciting. So many, it's not only the people, you know, it's the city. It's, we embrace the city in catching up on Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we'll call it Think Tech Talks. We'll call it Catching Up in Kaka'ako. We'll call it Land Use in Special K. That's my, my code word. And Sanford Murata is here. He's a real estate uh, professional. He's been with us before. Uh, thank you for coming down, Sam. You're welcome. My pleasure. Great to have you here so we can philosophize. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your connection with Kaka'ako. Well, you're right. Kaka'ako is a topic to be excited by, especially today with all the events that are occurring that's generating lots of news. Well, first of all, I'm born and raised in Hawaii. Went to school on the mainland at Berkeley. Took my degree in urban land economics. Came home and was very fortunate to get a position at Billingham Corporation, which in those days was uh, quite precious. Learn real estate. Alamo Alamoana Center. The Alamoana Center was involved with, with that and quite a uh, good learning experience. I learned about real estate management, real estate development, which is what I did early on. And from that time, I was able to join with the group of folks that developed hotels, shopping centers, office buildings, and condominiums learn a lot about the real estate development process and in fact the the difficulty in getting anything developed the high risks involved and of course often the opposition that comes with the territory yeah. my uh, experience with Kakako before you before you go into that okay, though, go I'd like to make a remark if mm -hmm. I may sure you've seen it all you can through, seen through you know the most the most incredible period of Hawaii history, seeing all this development, seeing the city transformed into so many things, to see all that energy pop up. And you've been there, you've been there, all these major projects all through the years, you've seen it all, and I'm waiting for your book. <laughs> <laughs> Long time coming, and it won't be about Kakak or no real estate development. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can be assured. Lots more other interesting things for me to write about. Okay, sorry I interrupted. No, no, not at all. So you asked about my experience with Kakako. Probably most recently, mm, three areas of experience, one of which I was a development consultant to the then Victoria Ward Estate in the development planning for the uh, Ward properties, now Ward Village. After that, I was with Kamehameha Schools from 2001 to 2003 during which time I led a first time public private planning process for Kaakako with three partners, mm -hmm. Victoria Ward, the State of Hawaii, and Kamehameha Schools. And we did a strategic framework plan for Kaakako without boundaries. We charged our planners and consultants to come up with a plan that did not recognize boundaries in this way we, we did not we were not uh, constrained by artificial limitations and the purpose of that was to assist the University of Hawaii with bringing the medical school to Kakako Makai that was the that was the time it was being built yeah, yeah exactly and it, it uh, then governor Cayetano and then president for Bell at the University asked that we prepare a plan that could show what could happen in Kakako Makai and in the broader Kakako area if the medical school was brought to Kakako Makai, and so we did that. What a great question to ask. Okay. Wow, that's fabulous. You know, this is really heady stuff because things at that point were just emerging. The medical school was a transformative event for Kakako, for sure. That's right, yeah. Transformative and also, un unfortunately, still unfulfilled, unfulfilled uh, promise in that the, the idea was to use the medical school as the anchor, a medical education anchor 
to create a biotech, bioscience, bioeducational campus at Kakakamakai and also in the surrounding Kakaka area. I remember the, um, the story, which was oft repeated, was uh, when um, Edwin C. Edwin, mm -hmm. not Ed, but Edwin C. I don't know what it stands for. Cadman, the yes. dean of the medical school, who is a lovely, wonderful man, really, um, stood uh, in the offices of HCDA in 677 Alamoana and looked over the domain there, mm -hmm. looked over Kakako Mackay, and he reported to the people around him that he saw this as a big pharma cam campus, and that's what he wanted to do. So the medical school was only the beginning. He wanted to bring them in from all over the country, the biggest pharma companies possible, and make this a high-tech, uh, biotech campus uh, uh, without comparison. I mean, and wow, what an idea that was. He could have done it, I think. Yes, a uh, great person, yeah. great visionary, and he basically saved the medical school uh, it was on its uh, deathbed prior to his arrival. He had a vision. He shared that vision. He convinced the legislators and others who supported that vision to not only move the medical school, but to create a medical school that would have great uh, potential for the university, as well as to create a bioscience industry for Hawaii. Unfulfilled vision, I still have, I'm optimistic. I still have hopes that that can come about, but it needs tremendous political will, courage, and determination for that to happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, Dean Cadman is, uh, has not been able to fulfill that vision, and, and we need others to step up. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's still possible. I mean, I think uh, just my, my own recollection is that when he got sick from a neurodegenerative mm -hmm. disease, had to step down ultimately from deanship. He taught for a while, then he stepped down altogether, and at some point, I. I can't remember when, a few years ago, he left for the mainland to yes. be with his family there. Uh, what a loss that he couldn't fulfill the promise. Um, but, you know, right, right around that time, history has a way of insinuating itself into the best plans. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this A&B project there. Uh, we got very political with uh, Linda Lingle and Ted Lieu. Uh, and around uh, 2005 or so, 2000, yeah, 2005, this, this was a great plan. It was in the paper all the time. And unfortunately, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to make, I'm making a, make an opinion about it, but it, it fell off the side. It did. Uh, a group called SOS Hawaii, Save Us Surf mm -hmm. Hawaii, got in the way and complained about it. And, and um, so what we had was the end of the A and B project, but nothing to replace it. It left behind it a swath, a vacuum. It was Sherman's march to Atlanta. <laughs> it, was, it was burnt landscape and it was radioactive and nobody wanted to touch it <laughs> for several years. <laughs> That's right. And, and I can express an opinion, maybe a biased opinion, because I led that group. I assembled the team. This is the AMB team that responded to the requests for proposals for the development of 15 acres at Kakakumakai. We we're one of several teams that submitted proposals. We were able to um, be awarded the right to negotiate the use of that property for the project that had been proposed. And at that time, the RFP included the use of residential use, a property to anchor the project. And therefore, we did include residential uses. We scaled it down after several public hearings where many expressed some concern about the residential component. So it was scaled down, but nevertheless it could not succeed without that residential compo component. It needed mm -hmm. economically feasible. Economic was not feasible without yeah. the revenue that would be gen that would be generated by the sale of condo units. And it, and it would have been a I believe a great contribution to Kakako because it would have, uh, we would have uh, uh, added lots of public uses that does not exist today and may not exist because I'm not sure we can afford to do that in the future. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, public projects have to be feasible too. That's right. And <laughs> you can't assume that there's a, you know, an unlimited pot of money out there somewhere where the legislature can, you know, sort of unleash it all over a given area and make amazing things happen. It has to be financed, it has to be carefully planned, 
And there has to be sufficient funds politically and, in fact, to do it. And so, um, you know, the plan was huge, as I recall. It was, it was a walkway all the way from Aloha Tower, ultimately, yeah? Ultimately, that was through, the... Through Kakakomakai, through Kualo Basin, through Ala Moana, all the way to Waikiki. It was a grand that's plan. Right. That was a great waterfront plan. It had been uh, planned and visualized um, many generations ago and had just been coming onto its own recently. But, of course, that died with the KNB project. Yeah, that's true. It was that radioactive thing. Yes. You know, nobody wanted right. to touch it after that. That's right. And so uh, the tech park didn't happen. Uh, the, um, that plan didn't happen. None of the elements of the connectivity between uh, Aloha Tower and Waikiki happened. It just stopped cold. Uh, and, you know, I was watching it from the tech point of view. Uh, it burned tech badly because people, you know, had forgotten about tech. Tech got washed under the waves. So That's right. And even now today, there's very little tech, if any, in Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. It's it just lost its momentum completely. It shows you how history moves on. And, um, the, you know, the best laid plans can be overtaken by dis disruptive disruptive events. <laughs> well, it's, it's unfortunate, yes, uh, the, the cancer center, which did eventually get built, was scaled down considerably. And that would have been another anchor to create this bioscience, biotech campus to energize a, an industry that we don't have in Hawaii, but we should have to um, add to the forces that can support ourselves economically. And, and the unfortunate aspect of that is that there was a lot of misinformation, miscommunication, uh, wrong assumptions, and therefore we did not communicate well enough, educate our public as to the value of that vision. And it's uh, fallen off, as you say. And, 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 still, it's, and it's still like that, too. I mean, it's an incomplete. And so we begin, you know, our evaluation of where Kaka'ako is today. We have to understand the history or we will be doomed to repeat it, I think. Exactly. And yeah. uh, there are all kinds of things that happened that sort of dug a hole. So you had the failure of the AB project and nothing to replace it. You had the failure of the tech center, nothing mm -hmm. to replace it. You had the failure of the walkway. And essentially, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, but that original cancer research center was going to be like $300 million. It was going to be huge, much bigger than the one that was ultimately built. Yes, yes. And that really didn't work out as originally contemplated. So that's sort of, that's sort of the, the environment in which we start our examination about what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And right after this break, Sanford, we're going we're gonna to start making that evaluation. Good. <laughs> Okay, this is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about Kaka'ako, catching up on Kaka'ako. We're talking about land use in Special K, that's what we call it. Uh, with Sanford Murata, real estate uh, professional. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard, and I host the show Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series right here every Wednesday from 2 to 3 Hawaii time. I would really love to have you watch the show and see what we do here. I talk with some of the most amazing people, artists, most of them, all of them involved in some sort of artistic process. And our goal here on the show is to dig into that artistic process and you would not believe what some people say, what some people do, what people go through to express. And these are people who have to express somehow and I find that infinitely interesting not only that they have to express but how they end up doing it I really hope that you will watch the show and enjoy talking with some of these people the same way that I do thanks and I hope to see you soon on center stage on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series Wednesdays from 2 to 3 see you soon okay we're back we're live we're here with Sanford Murata real estate professional who has spent uh, decades of his life in and around Kaka'ako uh, doing incredible plans and, and projects there. Here on Think Tech Talks, catching up on Kaka'ako land use in Special K. That's our word for it. Uh, so, you know, one thing you mentioned before the break, Sanford, I want to just take a moment to ask you about it, is uh, this public-private planning process where uh, Kamehameha Schools was involved, the state was involved. Victoria Ward. Victoria Ward was involved. Yes now known as Howard Hughes. 
<laughs> yes. yes. Um, what, what is instructive about that now? I mean, is there anything that we can take out of that particular mm. process and say, gee, this would help put the pieces together now? Yes. Well, probably the most important aspect is not to plan in a vacuum. You need to have all stakeholders involved, whether they represent private interests or public interests. And on the private side, as an example, Kakako, we combined the two largest private landowners in Kakako, which are Kamehameha Schools and then Victoria Ward, now Howard Hughes, which combine control about 100 acres. In addition to that, we believe it is important to engage the public sector in that planning process, represented by HCDA. It's not only does it control property in Kakako, but it also is the public agency that oversees the development from a government entitlement process of the uses in Kakako. So you need the major stakeholders. You need all interested parties involved, whether they have anything at stake or not, their ideas, their comments, their vision are important to be considered. Everybody has a valuable aspect, a valuable idea to contribute. So you need to engage all of these parties. You know, we had, uh, just take a moment, uh, we had last night, we had our little program at the Capitol Auditorium. Um, and we wanted to address Kaka'aka with some of the candidates. Uh, we asked uh, all the gubernatorial candidates to uh, come and tell us their views, their positions, their recommendations, uh, what they would do if elected on Kaka'aka. And we invited some of the um, lieutenant governor candidates, too. And um, the governor did not appear. Um, Duke Iona did not appear. Mufi Hanneman did not appear. But David Ige appeared. And we also had... Um, uh, it was Jeff Davis mm -hmm. from KG, KGU, the solar guy. He appeared. He's running for governor. And we had um, Kimo Sutton, um, Ike Sutton's son, from way back. Uh, he appeared as lieutenant governor candidate. And we had a lot of people. God, it's a, hundreds of people showed up. And I guess they really wanted to express themselves as well as listen to the campaign platforms. But one thing I got out of that was that you and I sit here, we talk about planning concepts, mm -hmm. we talk about land use, we talk about, you know, the development of the city, no margins, you know, free flow of sort of urban, urban material somehow, um, with, with a, you know, the view toward making a livable city to the max. And now we have this opportunity, but I don't think that the people in the room were on that page. Mm -hmm. I think they were in silos. Yes. And yes. kulianas. Right. And I say to myself, you know, if you have this public-private planning process, which wraps around, you know, with the public and, and tries to bring in public constituencies, you have a problem if they don't know the, the basic planning concepts mm -hmm. of how you build a... What was your reaction? I think that's exceptionally insightful. The obstacle we have in terms of developing property in Hawaii often is the lack of information and education that public and community voices will express. It's unfortunate because maybe developers are not doing a good enough job to educate and inform those voices. Maybe those voices are not willing to listen and learn. What causes me great concern, and we talked about this somewhat at our last talk story session in September of last year, and that is that we're starting to develop a lot of, as you call it, silos and gatekeepers instead, instead of servant leaders. Mm -hmm. And what I've been thinking about a lot since our conversation in, the, in September of where is the Aloha? What does it mean, and, how, and what can we do to sort of um, overcome the, the lack of aloha, maybe, or the lack of respect, the lack of willingness to listen to each other? So uh, as, I, as I described last time, I'm going to tell a little story to express and illustrate the thinking that I want to 
uh, for us to describe, and that is the Japanese concept of mo tai nai. Mo tai nai. M O T O. M O T T A I N A I. Mo tai nai. Okay. Gee, I want to know what that is. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, very loosely, it uh, can be described as, or, or, or means, what a waste. And uh, growing up uh, in post four years, my mom and dad used to say that a lot, mo tai nai, what a waste. And where that comes from is the, it's a kind of a Japanese expression of not being respectful of what we have, not, being appre not appreciating and be grateful and being grateful of what we have. And I think about that in terms of the aloha, because the multi nai concept comes uh, to some degree from the Buddhist concept of uh, connectedness. We're all connected. And that we find as a, an element in aloha. Right? The, the word aloha comes from to share the breath. And so therefore, what that demonstrates to me in, in aloha is we're all connected. We need to share each other's breath. We need to respect breath, breathe, and learn yeah. from each other and to hear each other. And, 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 and this uh, Motai Nai has become an international campaign based on uh, reuse, recycle, and uh, repair, and redo. Now, uh, the reason why I bring this up is because we kind of have lost the idea of being respectful of, we have, of what we have, being respectful of what others have to say, listen and learn before we uh, express our opinion. And to me, we need to adapt that attitude in Hawaii, whether it's Special K, whether it's Kakako, or any other place of our island. We need to be much more uh, grateful of what we have and to listen and to learn from each other so we can move forward in a cohesive fashion. That is a re because of, we lack that, that basically has killed the, the vision for Kakako for now, at least Kakako Makai for now. Yeah. You know, I, I might have learned this term from you, but the term I'm remembering, which is kind of a cousin to Motanai, is mm -hmm. Shigatakanai. Yes, yes. So what's the relation? That means uh, it is what it is. You can't do much about it. Mm -hmm. where, 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 where does that fit in this analysis you've made? Well, shigatakana means uh, can't be helped. Yeah. Or you accept the, the situation as it is, as it is and, and you don't fight a, a, a situation that is probably cannot be uh, overcome. You just accept what you have the and do the best you can with what you've got. The, the idea of mo tai nai, I believe, talks more about wasted, not only wasting resources, but wasted actions. And we go through a lot of that. There's a lot of wasted actions, and, and I attribute that largely to lack of information, lack of education, and maybe to some degree a lack of cohesive core values for Hawaii. And, and you might say, if you look back sort of in, in terms of uh, cultural aspect of Hawaii and look at aloha as a, uh, as a force that would bring people together, we need to re rekindle that. I think we need to think more about that. We need to think about the word pono a lot more. What is right? What is right for the common good? What is right for everybody? We, and going back to your idea of silo makers and gatekeepers, that's what's happening. We have too many gatekeepers here resisting change, not because they don't believe in the change, but because they think they're going to stand something to lose in the change. Yeah, and I think that helps define where we are in Kakaako. Yes, that's where we are. There's a lot of people saying no. A lot of people in silos and protecting their own uh, kulianas, not willing to hear the other side. You know, it strikes me listening to you that Part of this, just one degree off, is the notion that, gee, wouldn't it be better to have something than nothing? 
I don't mean something bad, but something that, you know, it, it's a reasonable attempt. It's not unreasonable. Something that maybe not everybody would agree to in, you know, in their view of the world, but something that they could tolerate. Mm -hmm. and, and so had we gone through with some of these projects, I mean, not only Kaka'ako, but elsewhere in the state, we might have something there. When we go radioactive, and we all, you know, we all say, ah, finished. You know, it must be a Japanese word for that. I'm out of here. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> when we have that, which I think we've had in Kaka'ako, uh, then we have nothing. And it sits there year after year, decade after decade. And, it, you know, it's a cheat on our lifetimes. Wouldn't we be happier in Sanford if something had happened there? Anything, actually. Mm -hmm. If something had happened to enrich the place. I mean, all the great cities of the country have waterfront development, all of them. Yes. And we don't. Sorry, yes. we don't. Yes. We have fishing boats, you know, that have been there. We have that, uh, that restaurant at Fisherman's Wharf that closed, what, 30 years ago or something? That's it. I mean, what a dump. And, and anyway, so, you know, we, we cheat ourselves of having something rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. We cheat our, our children out of something. We cheat the community. And we wind up, after all this, HCDA is a good example, nothing after all these years. So that's the, that's the landscape we begin on. You know, this is the, that's where we start our discussion of what actually is happening in Kakako. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you right after this break, okay. in your perception of it, what is happening in Kakako? Can you give us a kind of status report mm -hmm. about the land use in Special K? We'll be right back with Sanford Murata, real estate professional, deeply, deeply involved in Kakako over the years. Uh, we're catching up on Kakako today, as we do every Wednesday, 3 to 4. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Willow Chang Elion, and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process, and they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show, whether they live here or they live abroad. It's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping it Pono. Okay, uh, we're back. We're live. We're here with Sanford Murata, real estate professional. We're catching up on Kaka'ako about land use specifically. So given the history we've been sort of touching on um, and your, your involvement in a number of these projects, uh, and we're, the fact that right now none of the projects, am I right, that were contemplated before have happened. And we sort of start with a fresh canvas. I mean, that's what it looks like. Um, so what is, can you, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to answer my own question. My question to you, Sanford, is what is the status? What, give us a status report, land use-wise, about what's happening there. Well, it's quite obvious what's happening in Kakaku. Essentially, we know, developers know, that we lack residential inventory. Consequently, and by a lot. Consequently, developers are developing high-rise condominium projects, most of which are high price. Some of which are affordable, but most of which are high price. That is uh, not unusual. When a new place is discovered, and let's say, I'll give you an example, south of Market in San Francisco, when the baseball stadium was built, and which catalyzed the redevelopment of south of Market, lots of other things followed. And that's what's happening in Kakako. Once the market turned to support the development of residential condos, developers realize that Kakako is the heart of the city. It's a central location where people want to be. It's the bridge between Waikiki and downtown Honolulu. So it's, it's a very convenient location, but underutilized, underappreciated, underdeveloped for many years since HCDA was formed about 30 years ago. So what we're seeing is sort of a rush to fulfill that, or fill the void of underdeveloped properties. Now some, of, some of that market is, of course, 
offshore, some of it are foreign investors who realize that Hawaii, specifically Honolulu, is a great place to own a residence. Whether they, li they live in it full time or not, it's a place that they want to be. So that really gives it sort of an aura of uh, attraction, an aura of value and that's causing people to want to buy in Kakaku. We're also having people who live outside of the Kakaku district and want to be in an urban area. So they're coming and buying units. And that is going to happen, I feel, for, I believe, for another few more years. I don't know what the, what the saturation point is for condominium mm -hmm. units, but I'm hopeful that that development will spur the kinds of development that make a neighborhood thrive. We, we, we need to have commercial uses, retail uses, entertainment uses, and obviously real important are living units that are affordable for lots of other folks. Well, to, to start with uh, what you started with, um, the, thing, the thing about housing in Hawaii is we don't have enough inventory. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize the corrosive effect it has on our society if we don't have enough housing. Right. I mean, housing people can afford real housing. Um, and you know, it's just one way to send people out of town. I mean, to send our kids away. It's one way to you know, make life less, less pleasant, not to have a house. Um, it's one way to accelerate homelessness, not to have a house. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to have more housing. That's clear. I mean, uh, I think all the developers would say that and uh, the builders would say that. But it's true. The economists are saying it too. Paul Brubaker sent me a note before that program yesterday. So you got to tell them, you know, that we need more housing. Well, of course we do. <laughs> but, you know, the, the problem here is that you also have to have a market, a free right. market. If that's the way it works here and anywhere. And uh, if somebody overseas is willing to pay millions of dollars for a condo, well, that's, that's part of the market. Mm -hmm. And so the conundrum, you know, the, the, the tension on this is what do you do when you need, you know, local housing, but the market calls for housing that is expensive, housing that satisfies the need from, over, from outside the state? Mm -hmm. How do you satisfy the need for local housing when the housing when the housing market is talking to another another constituency, how do we fix that? How do we do? How do we deal with that? I never promised you easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a uh, complex question with a complex answer. Part of the problem with building affordable housing is purely cost. And so you can, you can uh, and there are various segments of costs, one of which is land costs. Mm -hmm. And so to reduce land costs, you have to have higher density, more units on the same piece of property so that the cost is shared by a greater number of units. Consequently, we have to go up in the air. And that's what our center city projects will look like. We can't afford to build single family homes on urban properties much anymore or they become totally unaffordable. Mm -hmm. So we need to accept that fact. Also is the cost of construction. We off, people have the, uh, I think, wrong impression that developers are greedy and or making uh, a uh, amount, of, amount of profit that is um, sort of beyond reasonable. Uh, that's not true. The units are sold based on what the market can buy, what the market can afford to buy, but also it's based on what the developer can afford to, to build. And on, in Hawaii, unfortunately, the cost of construction and the cost of delivering real estate products is high. It's higher than almost anywhere else for lots of reasons. One of which is the lack of entitled land. So we should build where the land is entitled. That's basically in the center of our city, in the heart of Honolulu. If we want to keep the country country, then we have to make the city city. And the way to do that is to go in the air, build high density, but also to make our neighbors, neighborhoods better. And in this case, we can expand out of Kaukau and say, okay, let's say Kaukau was the center of our city, but we have a lots of other locations which we can build great, or should build great neighborhoods 
with more residential units. Mo'ili'ili is one. And let's pick up on that example, Mo'ili'ili. If Mo'ili'ili needs to be a uh, community, a neighborhood that supports the University of Hawaii Manoa campus, Manoa yes. does not have a college campus town to support it. Yes, and it really needs one. And it needs it. And it, it, it can only make the, the university stronger. Well, if we were to spend some money with infrastructure, public improvements, entitlements, and other rights, incentivize developers to develop Mo'ili'ili and build a bridge across the Alawai from University Avenue, we can connect Mo'ili'ili with Waikiki. We can cause people then who are visitors to come, who come to Honolulu, who would like to see a nice college town environment. And lots of people like to do that. They can walk from Waikiki across the bridge over the Alawai to University Avenue and experience a wonderful neighborhood. Well, Mo'ili'ili is not that, but Mo'ili'ili can be that and should be that, and I hope someday we will uh, support that vision. Mm -hmm. So that's just one, an exa one example of building great neighborhoods to make a great city. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I think we might have talked about this last September, too, about Mo'ili'ili. I mean, you've got the two-story uh, old walk-ups, and they're really not, not modern. They're not 21st century, yes. and the owners would like to let it stay that way because they don't want to go into the trouble of raising the money and building and all this, even though we really need that. And um, I guess the question is, uh, how, how, do you, how do you incentivize those owners in Mu'ili'ili, all over Mu'ili'ili, there's such great potential there. How do you incentivize those guys into renewing the neighborhood? I mean, we don't want the government to come in mm -hmm. by itself and renew it because that's bad business. Uh, it, you got to incentivize private industry, private owners to do that. But how do you do it? Do you give them a tax credit? Uh, what, do, what do you suggest about that? Because it really, I absolutely agree, this has to happen. And the sooner the better. Right. Well, Mo'ili'ili has a special problem. And that is that the sewer line is at capacity. So we need to fix that first. So underlying all of this discussion, underlying the development, the enrichment, the fulfillment of the vision for any neighborhood, for any city, begins with infrastructure. Without sound infrastructure, we can't do any of that. Consequently, we're spending the money, our public money, in the wrong places. We need to go look at infrastructure and say, okay, what can we do to make our infrastructure sound so that it can support the development of our city. Build the platform, that's what it is, it's Build, a platform. That's basically the foundation. Without the infrastructure, you, you're, you're basically uh, not able yeah. to proceed with development. That's probably part of the problem with Mo'ili'ili. So if I go and look to build a condo in Mo'ili'ili now, the Department of Planning and Permitting going to tell me, no, we can't handle that on the sewer lines. Correct, yeah. I mean, you, that's you a cannot, big problem. You're not able to do anything in Mo'ili'ili, right? New, new development yeah. of any size because of the uh, sewer problem. We just don't have the, the, the existing line does not have any more capacity. So we've got to get the, well, the city council, the public has to understand this. Right. Nobody gets excited about building sewer lines. You know, it's like the last thing in the priority list. And yet, it's, it's the key to renewing these neighborhoods. Absolute key. And, and uh, it also relates to Kakako Makai. Kakako Makai needs a lot more infrastructure. Just take uh, cleaning up the pollution at Kakako Makai. You know, it was a city rubbish dump when I was growing up. I learned to fish, fishing off of disposed car bodies <laughs> on the waterfront <laughs> at Kakako. That's where I learned to fish. Yeah. So it was filled with uh, cars that were dumped there, surrounded by a rubbish dump <laughs> next to a <laughs> incinerator. That's where I learned to fish. So we have to clean up, we have to clean that up. And, and so there's not a lot of recognition of what needs to be done to get anything accomplished. Well, you know, but that, <clears throat> that, that sounds in the whole area of what I would call uh, unfunded liabilities, you know. I mean, Peter Ho came to one of our programs a couple of years ago and he said, hey, you know, you got to know <clears throat> there's $40 billion of unfunded liabilities out there and we don't have the money. 
Yeah. And uh, right. you, you got to build that into your, your planning and your thinking. And mm -hmm. so, yes, it would be valuable to improve the infrastructure. Yes, it would improve the city. It would solve problems in Mo'ili and Kaka'ako. But what's first? Where, where do you go first? You go to the schools, you go to the roads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you notice, we, do we have the money? When will we have the money? Uh, and, you know, and, I mean, one of the issues is the homeless. That's a kind of an infrastructure problem. We have to deal it with is. that. It is. And we have to pay that, and we don't even know how much it is. Uh, so, I mean, we got a problem in the city, I think, uh, and we don't have enough money to do the things we should be doing to keep current. Uh, it's a very serious problem, and it's going to be constraining going forward, I think. It's a serious problem, and it's only going to grow. Yeah. Let's just take three things. Okay. okay. We have the rail. That's $5.3 billion. We have and climbing. And climbing. <laughs> we don't know what it's going to end up being. That, that is just to construct. Okay? That doesn't mean we don't have any, uh, we, we don't have yet the, ball, the budget to maintain, operate, and to uh, create new infrastructure as the rail ages, capital improvements. So we have rail at $5.3 billion. We have the sewer system, which needs to be modernized and repaired. And that's something around $3.8 billion. We have the deferred maintenance and repairs to the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and the public schools. That's another billion dollars. So that's rough almost $10 billion. So if you take $10 billion and divide it by the entire population of the state of Hawaii, and let's say that's $1.4 million almost, that's $7,000 per person. And woman and child. Man, woman, child, seven thousand dollars per person. Have we? Ha, I mean, how that many people really more. recognize this? Just three things, and that represents thirteen percent of our annual GDP. Thirteen percent of our annual GDP uh, has to go to those three items. We have not even taken into account the unfunded. Retirement, public uh, employees' retirement system. Billions on that one. That's about seven billion dollars by itself. Isn't and that, that incredible? It's going to be crisis. It's a huge crisis. So, uh, we, we, this is what I'm talking about in terms of information and education. Often, public officials, the public in general, and many others, don't realize and understand what the big picture looks like. We need, we need to take into context everything we do and its impact on not only ourselves, not, not only us as individually, not only on our resources, not only on our infrastructure, but on our financial wherewithal. Can we afford to do this? And that's seldom answered. I, I guess the other side of this, if we do this, will it generate more money so that we can have more money to do other things? I mean, for example, one of think tech's issues from the very beginning, which is now almost 15 years, is if we put some money into building technology, however you build it, I mean, people differ on exactly how to do this, but if you put some state money into building, incentivizing technology, kind of what happened in San Diego, uh, we put the biotech there, then, then billions crossed, crossed the threshold. And now you have another kind of economy that, that is a high-octane economy not to use the word octane, but high octane economy. And that high octane economy can provide more tax revenues and can provide the money to pay the unfunded liabilities and the incentives and the infrastructure we've been talking about here. And if we go, you know, rack and pinion and just keep on going the same speed down the same road in terms of tourism with all the glass ceilings of tourism, we're not going to get there. We'll never have the money. That's a, a think tech thought. Yeah, absolutely right. And uh, I've studied uh, the biotech industry, bioscience industry, bioeducation industry in San Diego quite a bit. And it took only a generation from when they really started, had a serious plan, had a, uh, quite a clear vision on what they wanted to do to diversify its economy. It took the city of San Diego and all those others involved about a generation, roughly 30 years, to create a new industry, a thriving industry, a very important one, which then takes the place of some of the other things that have fallen off. 
this is what we need to do in Hawaii. And what I believe is the most important to create that is public education. We need to put our money in public education, not in the rail. I'm not against urban mobility. I'm not against finding the best way to move people from place to place. But I think that they, we need to establish the priority of our needs first and put our money where we're going to get the greatest return. And I believe it's in public education. And public, public education, Stanford, is right here. Yes. At least in part. And uh, it's you coming down, and I hope you come down again soon. I would like to, we didn't really get started on a lot of issues that I think you and I both wanted to talk about. Um, but if you come down again, we'll sure, continue gladly. down the track. Let me take just one minute. We have one minute left, and I wonder if you could describe for me your vision of an, of an optimal Kaka'ako. What would the land use be? And could you include in your answer one of the elements that came up last night which was the, <clears throat> some people dread this, the dreaded concept of rent control, <laughs> which that came from nowhere. You're flying in the door, rent control. Anyway, what's your vision for how it would work best? Okay, gladly. <laughs> thoughts, closing thoughts. Oh, right now. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, as I described, Kakako should be the heart of our city, the bridge between Waikiki and downtown Honolulu. And it needs all the different uses that make a neighborhood a neighborhood, that make a city a city. It needs, for instance, f starting first of all, people. We need a lot of residential uses. Hopefully we need those to bridge uh, the, the wide range of affordability. We need affordable units as well as the price of units, and it's sort of mankind, right? It's natural. You're going to have people who can afford some, people who can afford a lot. We need to accommodate those folks. But we need to have other uses to make the neighborhood thrive so we're not having people walled off in high-rise towers without any activity on the ground. It's on the ground that will make the neighborhood a neighborhood. So we need all of those mom-and-pops, retail stores, restaurants, sidewalk cafes, uh, theaters, uh, public places that connect private places. And those are streets, paths, alleys, parks, Yes, all of those elements. But we need every kind of aspect of a neighborhood th that makes a neighborhood great in Kakako Makai, in Kakako, and that's what I see. You know, it's dawned on me, and man, I really appreciate your comment on it, is, uh, is that even if you have a certain number of buildings down there which are really expensive and where local people could never afford them, you can still have a neighborhood um, because you will have some affordable units. We can argue about how many, but you still have some affordable, and you'll have neighborhoods nearby that will feed mm -hmm. in. And I'm coming to the conclusion personally that it's okay to have a neighborhood which draws, the, which like a magnet, people from all around the city and the state to come there and enjoy. Like we lost that in Waikiki somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. But right. maybe we can achieve it here in Kaka'ako where I may not live there, but I want to go anyway. Sure. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, not, not only uh, across our city and across our state, but we want to draw people from all over. It just enriches a place. Right? We get people from all over and we learn from each other, we respect each other, we um, kind of get a sense of we're all connected. And that's what Motai Nai means, and that's what Aloha means. The word of the day, Motai Nai. Mo, Motai Nai. Motai Nai. Motai Nai. Uh, and Aloha with uh, Sanford Murata, a real estate professional who has had um, a really a, a, at least a good part of his professional life in Kaka'ako. Here on Think Tech Talks, catching up on Kaka'ako, land use in Special K. And we'll be back. We'll be back with Sanford Murata later to continue this conversation. Thank you, Sanford. Thank you. <laughs>